Good uh, morning, everyone. Um, I don't know where you are uh, basically joining us from any part of the world. We want to thank you for joining us in uh, today's building from ground up. Um, generally, it's, um, it's all about tech stories. It's all about um, people in tech and letting uh, the world know how exactly they were able to uh, start their ventures and grow from where they are, where they were uh, to where they are right now. It is um, uh, brought to you by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub, basically created and brought to you by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub in, in collaboration with, as, as a creation, uh, because of course we have uh, the UK Nigeria Tech Hub has uh, technical partners in trying to uh, bring it across to um, listeners or viewers across the world. Um, but let me start by introducing the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Um, and basically, it's initiated by the UK government's Department of Digital Culture, uh, Media and Sports uh, to support the growth of uh, the technology ecosystem in Nigeria. The UK Nigeria Tech Hub works to stimulate local digital economies, uh, support inclusive and sustainable economic growth and jobs, build high-end digital skills and forge innovative partnerships between Nigeria tech sectors and um, international business. So basically that is what the UK Nigeria Tech Hub is. Uh, but Building from Ground Up is a program that seeks to build startup founders, innovators and entrepreneurs across the Nigeria and UK uh, United Kingdom um, tech ecosystem to share stories on their entrepreneurship journeys and how they are able to scale their business. So basically it is an opportunity for you and I to be able to learn. I also, I'm one of those people that just recently entered the ecosystem. So I'm, I'm keen to hear uh, from our guest today and just basically let us know what is going on and how they were able to scale their business. This is somebody I've also watched uh, for uh, a while. Uh, I've been able to watch her growth and it's been quite interesting. Sorry, I, I, I yes, I keep trying to bring that back into my mind. It's uh, this building from ground up is brought to you in partnership with uh, Tech Cabal, uh, yes. Yeah, so they basically are in work in the background. Their hands everywhere. You might not see them, but yeah, they're, they're here uh, also uh, giving support. So I'm going to be introducing, uh, you know, somebody I'm going to be speaking with today, who is of course um, somebody who has uh, changed a part of our health system in Nigeria because she was able to plug in in a very very important part in the ecosystem. Uh, she's a uh, Nigerian American. Um, uh, she's the founder of uh, and CEO of Life Bank, uh, a Nigeria health tech startup working to improve access to essential medical supplies in Africa. Um, she has over 10 years of experience in health management and department or with the Department of International Development, DFID, uh, the World Health Organization, Global Health Corps, and uh, the Lagos State Government. She has won several awards uh, for her outstanding work in healthcare, including Jack Ma's African Entrepreneur Prize, uh, which got applications from over 10,000 startups and 50, uh, in, from 50 African countries and has been honored on top uh, international platforms such as the World Economic Forum and the BBC. I'm talking about uh, the person, uh, no other person, but Timmy Kiwa Tubosuno. Is Timmy with us? Hey, Tunji. How are you? Hi. Hi. Um, Timmy, does it feel like I'm, I'm washing you a bit when I'm, when I'm reading out all this thing? <laughs> you know, they, people always have me send the bio and it's always like, wow, <laughs> who is this person yeah, you're talking yeah. about? <laughs> but, but you know the funny thing? You know the funny thing is it's interesting because um, I, I can remember the first time I saw you... Um, this, this this journey was just starting. This life bank journey was just starting. And it just felt like, you know, one of those people with a dream. Ah, she's just, ah, she's just dreaming big dreams. And, you know, when I'm reading this, I, I can feel it because I, 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 I saw the beginning and I'm seeing now. And while it, a lot of people might feel it is washing, it's actually true. Every single word of it is true. Uh, how First of all, I mean, let's just start from there. How does it feel to see... You know how they say it is um, how um, you, you know uh, the word has become flesh, mm. so to say. How does it feel? You know, I think that's the favorite part. Like my favorite part of running Life Bank is looking at. You know, I think there was an event that happened 
a few months ago, and we, we were launching a, a research center in, in um, uh, a partner institution here in, in Nigeria. And the research center is sort of like in a container. And, you know, I was standing there in front of, with a couple of people who have been on my team since day one. And I think I finally felt like, wow, you know, it's, you know, even launching this <laughs> year didn't, didn't seem to bring that. In, but it was that specific research center that was launched as physical. And I was like, wow, you know, we've really, we've really done something here and, and that this, this thing is becoming real. Uh, so it's really, it's incredibly gratifying um, to see your idea, the idea you always had become a real business that's growing and, and driving impact and driving uh, revenue growth, you know, across, you know, our region. So I'm incredibly happy about it. So, uh, Timmy, um, I, 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 I mean, I smile whenever I see people talking about you. I'm, I'm pretty much uh, pumped when I, when I hear people talking like, yeah, she, she, she's doing it, she's killing it. Um, but, you know, this is, this is an opportunity for people like us to learn um, how the story started. Um, and I think the, the first question is always, you know, because LifeBank was made very popular by your, uh, uh, by your ability to give blood services from one place to another. Um, and I, I need to say this, first of all, I'm very squirmish around blood. Um, so I couldn't have done this. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we, the world thanks you for it. Um, but, but why blood, though? Why, why did you start with there? Why did you, why, why was it a, a thought at, at the back of your mind that this is a place that needs urgent intervention? So when I was about, you know, when I was a little girl living in, the, in Nigeria, living in the US, um, I always had sort of like an overdeveloped sense of justice. Like I always felt like, you know, justice was really, you know, I always had a strong reaction uh, to, perceived injustice. So it was always part of who I was since, since I was a little girl. When I was 23, I came back, you know, after growing up in the US, I came back to Nigeria here uh, to work uh, in Northern Nigeria briefly for about a, you know, you know it, it was a three month internship while I was in graduate school in California. So I came back to Nigeria and I was working in Northern Nigeria. I was working in Jigawa, Kano, Kaduna. Uh, so I had a sense of, so I had a sense of, um, what is um, what is present in in uh, um, how our healthcare was? Um, it was it an an incident that happened in Kano that got me really uh, obsessed with uh, Matana healthcare. Uh, so it's been my thing since I was you know very young um, to see that you know women who deliver babies should not die while they're delivering their babies. And really for me, it's really that simple. It is. When you're delivering that child, you should get to survive and, and see that child grow up. And, and that's been like, I'm, I'm one of those, I think few people who, is, who, who has been a single issue person all her life and basically been obsessed with maternal health um, since I was 23 years old. So uh, I, go ahead. No, you were saying, you were saying. Right. Um, so I always had sort of like a professional interest in it. That's why I so worked at WHO, um, interned with DFID, uh, you know, worked at Global Health Corps in, in Uganda, worked at so many other, you know, private health systems in the U.S. before moving back to Nigeria. Um, so it's always been sort of like, you know, super focused on healthcare. And then I, I became a mom about six and a half years ago. Uh, my little boy, you know, is amazing, is, is fantastic. Um, um, more importantly, is, is alive. Um, it was a very difficult birth. Uh, I, um, I was very lucky to be in the US and I had access to all the supplies, all the things that I needed. Um, and I knew while I was delivering him that a lot of African women, a lot of women in Nigeria didn't have access to the same thing, the same you know, efficient health system. And while, while you know, going through that process, I started researching what, what was it that kills women in childbirth. And it's something called postpartum hemorrhage. Basically a mom gives birth and within a couple of hours, she starts bleeding and then she's dead. Um, so it's very catastrophic. It's the largest killer of women in childbirth in the world. It's not just a Nigerian problem, it's a global problem. It's a problem that you're gonna find in lower, lower to middle income countries across the world. Um, and I also found out that eight out of 10 women who die of postpartum hemorrhage 
could be saved if blood was simply in the hospital with them. So let's say, you know, you're delivering a baby, your blood type, two bags of your blood type is sitting in that same hospital room um, and you, will, you are most likely to survive the postpartum hemorrhage if the blood was available. So I thought uh, very, you know, with the hubris of, of being young, I thought, well, you know, I'm gonna solve that problem. You know, I'm just gonna, and it's really very simple. The, you know, our business model, you know, the work, you know, the, the, the solution that we have to the problem has been very simple in the beginning to say, we're gonna save mothers by making sure that blood is present in the hospital when they're delivering their babies. And that was it. That was the single um, insight, single interesting thing that, that started Life Bank. Mm. Mm. I, I see that it's it's always when you look at it from perspective of a problem and uh, and you know um, this this is one of the things I hear about from a lot of starters uh, startup founders um, you know a bit of naivety um, mm -hmm. if I knew it was going to be this difficult when I started I probably wouldn't have done it you know <laughs> <laughs> absolutely I think I said like after sitting it for a long time absolutely like I knew like so, I what, what were those things that made you feel this way? Mm -hmm. The very first one was, well, I, I don't want to say corruption, but it's kind of like corruption. Like you always sort of like think that, you know, I mean, at least I thought that healthcare, you know, will be exempt from this particular type of issue. <laughs> you, know, because, you know, you're treating people, you know, you're, you know, people who are in healthcare are usually, you know, altruistic and they want to do good. So I always sort of like expected, you know, complete honesty, complete focus on science and results. And, you know, the reality is it's still human beings that are, that are doing this work. And, and, you know, we still have a culture, um, a problematic culture. And it's just really hard. Like, you know, for example, you know, our model is to deliver curriculum resources, blood, you know, we've since grown out of just blood, we've grown to oxygen, we've grown to vaccines, uh, we deliver medical samples, we did a lot of work around distributing COVID-19 testing and COVID-19 samples, um, you know, we do, you know, we're sort of like a full suit of medical distribution at this moment. Uh, we even deliver things as simple as gloves, you know, to hospitals because they don't have it. Uh, so the business itself has grown past blood. Of course, blood is still an important part of what we do because I'm very passionate about it. But, you know, in terms of what we do as a business, it's grown really significantly. But I think, you know, one of the, and we have to, so we have to do all the work we do in 24 hours. You know, it's on demand. We are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We never shut down. We've not shut down in five years. And, you know, we are serving, you know, uh, a pop population from, a place like Lagos, to places like Kano, places like Plato State, places like, you know, so it's a sort of like we are in eight states in Nigeria, we're in Kenya now, we run 24 hour services, we never shut down. So it's actually quite difficult in terms of just like operating the business, you know, <laughs> you know, leave everything, leave finance, leave all the other things. It's really difficult to move supplies round the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, maintain the quality of the supply. Uh, you know, deliver it in the right condition, um, deliver it in under 50 minutes, you know, to hospitals, you know, in all these states around the clock. It's, it's actually quite a difficult thing to pull off, particularly in a place like Nigeria where, you know, access to infrastructure is very low. Safety is very, very low. You know, I, if I tell you how much we spend on just making sure that our team members are safe, uh, making sure that, you know, we have the right insurance, et cetera, it's really, 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 really capital intensive and very difficult. But I think for me, you know, what keeps us going is like knowing that we're impacting people's lives. Uh, literally, our impact is not something that is, uh, uh, um, it's not something that you have to look for. It's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's really real. It's, it's real. Uh, we know that every unit we move to the hospital, every time we deliver to a hospital, we know we are literally saving someone's life. I know that if I move a pack of gloves to a hospital and the hospital and the doctor makes sure that when he's doing the surgery, when he's doing the, when he's seeing patients is wearing gloves, we know we're saving the patients and the doctor. Uh, so it's so much, you know, for us, it, it's quite a difficult, it's very, very, very difficult, but I think it's also very rewarding. Mm. So um, I, I, I want to 
this this might be a bit uncomfortable, but I, I want to ask it anyways. Um, being a female tech founder of a business in Nigeria that, that is doing well, it, it must be very clear that is doing very, very well. Um, uh, also, I mean, the UK Nigeria Tech Hub, uh, the organizers of uh, Building from Ground Up also have uh, a bit of the um, interest in seeing more female tech founders in in, in Yes, in Nigeria, in, I, I mean, and the world as a whole. But um, I wanted to ask because I, I was I was I was reading a book recently, and uh, the person was talking about generally how people just react to female tech founders, and uh, it was about a particular business. I can't remember what the business was, and they said they had to then create because they they would send out newsletters and they would never get responses. There were two female uh, co-founders of this business. And then they had to create an imaginary third co-founder uh, mm. who was who had a guy's name, and wow. uh, they realized that he got uh, he got responses thirty percent quicker than they they got responses, wow. despite the fact that nobody even knew he who he was, and mm. they had never seen him, and he didn't even exist. Um, I, I want to know. I, what, what have, have there been challenges um, that are unique to just female uh, founders that uh, your male tech, uh, male founder counterparts have, have not been experiencing? Um, I think, you know, we, we live in a, um, I would say, patriarchal world uh, where, you know, of course, you know, people expect leadership. You know, when you, when you take a minute, you close your eyes and you think about a leader, often people don't think about women. You know, you don't, yeah. you know, you don't visualize a woman in a position of power. Uh, and for me, even even worse, you don't you don't in, you don't think about a mother. You don't think about somebody who's relatively young. So I have a lot of things going against me. <laughs> <It's a short laughs> of, short of that. Yeah. But I think for me, I think what matters is visibility. You know, I think mm. I have been through. You know, there are moments where you're like, wow. Uh, there are things, and I actually prefer, you know, having lived and worked in Europe, in, in Nigeria, um, I actually prefer Nigeria's brand of uh, chauvinism uh, because it's public and it's. Wow. Public, you, know, oh, you, wow. Know <laughs> you know how bad that is. They will tell you. You know Sorry. how bad that is to, to yeah. look at two evils and mm. say, okay, I prefer <laughs> this evil of the two. And, and <laughs> it's, it's just weird. It's just a no, crazy scenario. No, because you know where you stand, because people will tell you, you know, they will tell you like, you know, who's really in charge. You know, I've had comments like that all the time. Wow. So who's really the brain behind this business, you know, uh, you know. So, you know, you, 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 people really don't consider uh, leadership to be a, 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 a feminine or, or a, a woman thing, right? I, but I, I do think that for me, I'm very comfortable in, being a woman, I'm very comfortable being a leader. To me, there, there isn't a, you know, I don't try to be a leader. I am a leader because I lead, um, you know, I, and I manage and I have a ton of experience in the work that I'm doing and I'm incredibly passionate and I learn um, and I inspire my team. I pull them uh, <laughs> to, to the light. And for me, I think that it is that confidence and that, and, and being public about about the work you do. I think that that's really how you sort of like um, get up above uh, what people think a leader should be. I think I have a lot of empathy for people in, 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 in Nigeria generally. I have a, a empathy for people who actually feel this way because for me, I think that, you know, you, you know women lead well. I always believe that women, you know, can lead and lead well. And the way we lead uh, particularly, you know, with emotional intelligence, with, with calmness, inspiring our team. It's actually very valuable, you know, particularly when you're doing work that requires passion, right? So the way women lead, I think it really works for the, the business we do. In fact, I think men should learn from women uh, in terms of how to lead well, you know, how to lead better. I think the world needs a lot more empathy, a lot more kindness, a lot more passion, you know? Um, and, and for me, I think women naturally sort of like lead that way. And, and I, I really enjoy that. And, and, and I, I believe in the way that I lead as a woman. So for me, I think 
I'm always like surprised and taken aback, but also empathetic because I was like, you've never been led by, you know, a great woman. And that's why you're saying what you're saying. You should try it and you realize the difference and you always maybe even get the, the male leader in your life to, to learn from the women leaders so that they can lead with empathy and kindness. I think this is very profound uh, because I, I I know this to be true, um, and in, in my startup, it's it's a it's a deliberate attempt to make sure that I I have women leading in strategic areas because I'm I'm thinking you know you can't go wrong you can't go wrong if you if you have them in that area. Do I, I'm not entirely telling them, but yeah, yeah, I'm like yes. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, they need uh, the chairman of my business is, is, is fantastic, you know, CEO, awesome person. So, yeah, I, I do agree with you entirely. Um, let's, let's talk to funding. I'm, I'm also in that space right now trying to look for money. How did you do this? Help, help us, help us. <laughs> Tell us the, the secret. <laughs> How did you raise money? And, and also, we, we know that you raised a round um, and then there's, there's this grapevine gist that you just raised on another one. Mm. I don't know if the gist is very authentic, yes. but, but you tell us, how did you do it? First of all, let's know how you did it. You know, we've actually raised quite a lot of rounds that we've not been public about. Because Aha. for me, I think I'm trying to sort of like shift the, <laughs> the conversation from raising and raising to actually what, you know, actually expanding and scaling. Uh, what we will always announce at Life Bank is not a raise. We will always announce what we've done, uh, because I think that's why people should, you know, that's why people should give us props. Uh, around fundraising is a is a tool. You know, it isn't mm. it isn't an end. Um, you know, it's it's sort of like getting full. Like nobody's gonna congratulate you for getting full in your car. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, like oh wow, you got full. Yeah. Uh, for me, so I, I think it's like. This you know, uh, raising rounds uh, is like, you know, it's filling your car. So we've raised quite a lot of rounds, um, in multiple rounds that we've not announced. Uh, and it's because of me just really believing uh, in this idea of people should give us props for scaling the business, for hiring a great team, for doing amazing things, for driving impact, um, as opposed to for raising funds. But to your question mm -hmm. about raising funds, I think that for me, uh, there are multiple things that I think are important and I'm always weary for uh, in giving people's, people advice because it's really very healthcare centric and it's very life bank centric in terms of the knowledge that I have uh, in terms of fundraising. Uh, but I think that what matters is making the value clear. Um, a lot of people are often, maybe it also helps us because when I go to these meetings, people are quite surprised at what we've been able to achieve because we don't, we don't loud it, if you will. You know, we're we're not like a cool startup. You know, we're not we're not the startup where you think, you know, wow, what a great startup. You know, we are quiet. We are we are sort of like you know quietly you know executing and building about the work. Exactly about the work. So when we show up to these meetings and we're meeting investors and they see what we've been able to pull off, they're always sort of like taken aback and like, wow, you know, we didn't know and we we weren't aware. Uh, of what you've been able to do. And I think that helps because first they come to the meeting not expecting much. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, I show up, you know, and, and with my hair in the bun and, and they're like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> and then I, I bring out the number. <laughs> and, and literally, I remember our first round after the meeting, they're like, you know, this is all great, but, you know, and, and I, I wouldn't do that now, but at the time I literally just downloaded our bank statement. And this was like early. I literally just downloaded the bank statement and sent it to the investor because wow. they, they were like, like looking at their face. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like this is what we've been doing. <laughs> and you know, we were able to pull that round off. And, and I think partly because they actually just saw, you know, what we've been able to pull off uh, since since we launched. And you know, so for me, I think it's like, you know, first we're underestimated, which has always helped us. Two, we are really, really focused on delivering value. We are a value-focused business and our customers love us and we love our customers. And we're really about uh, making sure that we're driving value to our customers and returning, and they're returning value to us because they really care deeply about what we're doing. Um, I think three is, particularly if you're in a niche um, uh, sector, 
that isn't the most uh, obvious sector, particularly for VCs. For example, like VCs, they have been in positions where they want to book a hotel before. You know, they've been in a position where uh, you know they want to buy something. You know, they've been in positions where they want to send you know money from one place to the other. So naturally, they understand. Uh, some of the sector, you know, fintech is intuitive because they are a customer of fintech, you know, um, but healthcare is not as intuitive. So if you are not a healthcare focused person, or let's say you're education or whatever sort of like uh, more niche uh, uh, problem your, your, your startup is solving, make sure that when you're having those conversations with investor, there's somebody, there's one of you have, they have, you know, brought somebody who understands your sector in the room. I think that has been really helpful for us. You know, one of the first things when when we were, you know, one of the first rounds that we were raising, we pulled in um, an investor. We pulled in somebody who was a doctor in the room with the investor. The investor himself pulled in that person, so that you know, as we're talking, we were speaking our own language, and the investor was listening and understanding that there is some value here. So I think that for if you're a niche, you know, first if you're a woman or you're young or you're not a typical startup founder, make sure that when you're going to those meetings, you have your numbers and your numbers are really, you've done the work ahead of time. My second advice is if you're in a niche environment, if you're, in, if you're so like solving a problem that is not mainstream, I, I, healthcare is mainstream, but like if you're solving a problem that investors may not be intuitively uh, familiar with, pull in somebody who understands your sector that the investor trusts so that the conversation can be richer instead of trying to convince them that there's something there. Um, and, and I think just, you know, for me, I think investment, you know, getting funding, I think is not the, is not the end. Uh, what matters is the work you've done before you actually go into those meetings for funding. Uh, so we really, at Live Bank, focus on that. You know, we are obsessed, obsessed, like what I do, you know, 90% of my work is spent on operating the business, you know, and, and just like sitting down and staring at the business day in, day out, working with my team, training them, retraining them, uh, making sure that the business is strong. Um, and then I spend 10% of my time fundraising. Uh, so for me, I think it really matters. What really matters is focus on the work because you can get, you know, you can fundraise all the time. You know, you can spend all your time fundraising. And I don't think that's useful for your startup. Mm -hmm. So you have, um, you crossed the borders of Nigeria. You're not just in Nigeria alone anymore. How many countries are you in now, by the way? Well, in 2.5, the 0.5 we've not been public about is going to come out um, you know, in the next couple of months. But we are, so, so technically, we, two, what, what, which is the other country, Kenya? So we're in Nigeria, we're in Kenya, and we're in another country that uh, we are not public about yet. Yes, yes. So uh, tell us about the Kenyan story. Why did, why did Kenya look like the next destination? Um, why not Ghana? Why not Tanzania? Why Kenya? Mm. Uh, you know, so at Live Bank, we like to say we like solving difficult problems, uh, problems that are really hard. Uh, because the other thing is, I feel like if you're solving a difficult problem, many people don't want to solve things that are difficult, you know? So people are gonna leave you to it because they're really not, in, it doesn't seem easy. Um, so we, we really focus on, you know, how hard is this problem? And, and I also think that if you solve a problem that is really difficult, there will be a lot of returns and then you can own an entire value chain. Uh, and I think it's really important when you're building a business, actually own that chain and really dominate it and make sure that you're driving value in those chain, in, in, in the particular area that you're working in. So, you know, and Kenya had a very significant um, blood problem. You know, they had, you know, and we felt like there was value there to coming into Kenya and solving it. They're also English speaking. So, um, you know, translating a lot of our operating uh, 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 systems would not be really difficult. You know, it would be hard to translate to say, you know, um, um, French or any other language um, and because they're English speaking so we can easily sort of like move there um, and I think we also had local local uh, friends uh, I think that's also incredibly important as you're as you're launching and you're scaling you're not going to be able to physically be everywhere so what are sort of like those local relationships that you've built um, and we're also sort of like testing out uh, joint venture models 
uh, to make sure that we're actually partnering with local entrepreneurs on the ground who can be who can be the face uh, of the business on the ground. So those are the kind of things that we're thinking about as we as we continue to expand across uh, Africa. Awesome. Um, so please, uh, if you uh, if you're in the room right now, please do send your questions to the Q and A. Um, uh, 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 it's right at the top. Uh, you can just put in your questions there. I will take it after I ask uh, Timmy a few more questions. Um, particularly this one, Timmy, we're, we're both Nigerians. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, uh, you know we can't we can't we can't um, go past the. Um, anyhowness of Nigeria, um, especially in the health sector. Um, if there's anywhere there's anyhowness and it should not exist, is the health is the health sector. It's it's weird. Um, I've been to um, hospitals, uh, general hospitals, where they don't have running water. It's it bothers you to to God, and you are just like, why? I mean. Well, but um, I want to know, because um, as, a, as a customer, as a paying customer, um, because of the challenges of Nigeria, I have moved from going to any hospital that appears to want to give me anything for free mm, mm, to mm. the hospital I'm going to expressly pay for even the air I breathe so that I get <laughs> express, service, <laughs> express service. Um, <laughs> but this is me as a customer. And, and I, I think if I as a customer is getting this much trouble in terms of just accessing healthcare, yeah. I'm wondering how you, a co-practitioner in the system is finding pushback, is finding challenges, just being able to deliver your service to um, institutions that need your service. Uh, what, 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 what were the biggest challenges you saw in just being Nigeria and operating your business in Nigeria and just trying to make things better? I'm sure there were, there were challenges. Of course. Uh, like I said, we're both Nigerians. <laughs> so we are, <laughs> um, I like to say, like, I have built a business in Nigeria. There is nowhere in the world where I can do like they, you know, like I, I have I, I am now like I've been to the best school in how to operate a business because Nigeria is an incredibly difficult environment. Um, you know, but to your question, I think that you know, more so than anyone, we understand the problems in our health sector. We live it every day, we understand it, you know, we're familiar with it deeply, um, emotionally. Um and I think one of the things that make it really hard is we also know that they are solvable, right? So there's no water in a hospital. Why? I know exactly how to solve that problem and to make sure it doesn't happen again. And there are many, many people who know how to solve that problem that, and make sure it doesn't happen again. The private sector, you know, the private sector, the healthcare uh, delivery companies in the private sector have figured out how to solve that problem and make sure it doesn't happen again. So it's not, a lot of the problems in our health system are not difficult problems. You know, um, a, a couple of months back, I was speaking to some leaders in healthcare and we're like, you know, the worst thing about our healthcare, healthcare is people are dying, not because there is a novel disease like coronavirus and no one knows how to treat it. People are literally dying because there's no gloves. They're dying because there's no oxygen. Mm -hmm. Like the mm -hmm. simplest, simplest, they're dying because you know, they're getting infection because there's no water and people can't wash their hands. You know, someone delivers a baby with a torchlight. You know, mm. these are the reasons why our people are dying and these are the reasons why our health system is poor. In fact, sometimes I even think that we're really better. We're, we're much, much better at stopping diseases, major big mm. diseases mm. than we are. Mm. You know, in just making sure that we treat malaria and, and people deliver the baby and, you know, pneumonia is treated well which is you know, one of those like unintuitive um, insights that you can only get when you're, like, you're literally in and embedded deep into the business, into the sector. You know, for LifeBank, about 95% of our business in the, is in the private sector, right? We barely you know, work in the public sector. And to be honest, that is where the most problem, like that's that's where the most issue, like if you said, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, there's no water. 
I would be very surprised if that's happening in the private sector. What that's going to happen is the hospitals where there is no water, there's no gloves, you know, they're delivering babies by, you know, torchlight, they're doing all of these things. It's usually the public sector. And I think that part of the problem with Nigeria is the public sector is not, for the most part, interested in innovation services that's coming from the private sector. There's a sense of uh, protecting, you know, or, or separating public sector services and private sector innovation. For me, I think one of the things we need to do is make sure that the public sector is also open to this kind of innovation so we can solve these problems across all the hospitals in, in, in Nigeria. Now, there is no hospital, right? In Lagos, in Nabuja, in Portakot, in Ibadan, um, in, in Bayelsa, in, in all the places where we operate, there are no private hospitals that would not have blood. Once you plug into LifeBank, you will never run out of blood. Once you plug into LifeBank, you will never run out of oxygen. Even if there is a major, you know, during the, um, the NSAS movement and where no one could move, we were still moving. We were on standby. There was a couple of hours where we couldn't, we couldn't move, we couldn't go deliver. But as soon as everything was, um, things got calmer, we pushed and went to deliver, um, you know, we work 24 hours when there's you know, COVID-19 shutdown. We are always working. So if you're a private sector company, we can guarantee that you will not need oxygen. We know you, you will not need you know, blood. You're not gonna need gloves. You're not gonna need vaccines because you're plugged into the life banks innovation. But we don't have the same, we can't say the same thing for, for public sector hospitals. So I think the, the, where, the place where we have the most problem is in public sector. And if we can figure out how to get the public sector to uh, be interested in innovation, particularly innovation that are developed in the private sector, um, I think we'll be, we'll be in a good place as a, mm. sector, as a health sector, yeah. Mm. Mm. That, that was just a, that was uh, a rather um, sober moment, yeah, for your country. You just kind of feel, can we just do things right? You know, but yeah, you know, because it's, it's not rocket science most of the time. It's just yes. Yes. people yeah. not wanting to do what is right. And uh, we thank you for, for being uh, given the service. Uh, I mean, because it's, 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 it's a business, but it, it almost feels like a social service. It is a social service because at the end of the day, it's, um, blood is a major reason why a lot of people die in this country. Oxygen is the reason why a lot of people die. It's just crazy, it's just crazy. So thank you again. Um, I wanna ask about um, human capital mm. and um, you hiring um, in Nigeria. In Nigeria, you almost have to um, so there, there is the part where you look through the person's CV and mm. you know, okay, this person is qualified. And there's also the part where um, you just have to go with your gut. Mm. And for me, a lot of the time, I've, cause I've seen people, I've seen people with qualifications as in, ha, mm. Jesus. But <laughs> and then there's PPC, this is this, and then you're like, do this, and the person is like, how do I do it? And you're like, ah, what were you people doing? <laughs> but um, I just generally go with my gut. But how do you um, deal with um, people management uh, uh, and getting the right kind of people, and then the people are there, but you, how do you just generally manage your human cap uh, capital, your human capacity? You know, I think it's one of those secrets. Uh, superpowers uh, that Life Bank has, our people. I am so passionate about them. I love them. They are amazing. They are believers. Um, you know, anyone who comes to Life Bank is always surprised. Like, wait, what's happening? Are you guys a cult? Because we are deeply close. We are really passionate. We are really focused. Um, and it's really incredible that we've been able to build this kind of team in a country where that doesn't happen often. So I think it's one of sort of like you know, most people that are a live bank work years and years and years. And we're not, we don't pay, you know, we're not the most, we don't pay a lot, you know, in terms of compensation, but we, we have been able to select people who believed in the vision of life bank. They are there because they are, they're there to deliver the vision of life bank. And that's a really incredible thing. 
So we pay, we pay a lot of attention to our culture, right? I literally interview everybody who works at Life Bank. Probably not scalable, but I, I have, you know, ensure that it is a priority for me. And what do I do? So people, we have a system. The way we run our recruiting system is, you know, people, you know, the, the team that needs the, the candidate hires for the job. And then there's a culture check interview where I need to speak with that person and see whether they fit within our culture. And that culture check interview, I think is what has made LifeBank strong uh, up till now. Um, and it is, we have to, we, we, there are four cultural virtues that we have at LifeBank. And you will not become, no matter how great you are, no matter how fantastic, what packaging, what all of this you bring to the table, if you don't meet this four cultural guideline of virtue, we would not you know, give you an offer. And the value is, you know, you must care. You know, you have to care about your community. So you have to have some sort of um, volunteer. You, you have to have volunteered for a social problem before because we don't want you. If you're, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, you know, applying for a CFO and you've not volunteered for anything in your, in your past, we're not interested in that person. Because for us, we're passionate people. We want people who are committed to driving change in their communities. Uh, you know, we have things about you have to be relentless, you have to be, um, I'm looking up because I literally have it, you know, in every office where Life Bank operates, we have those four cultural virtues and we're really obsessed uh, with making sure that everybody that comes in uh, fulfills that cultural virtue. The next thing we do is if you should come in, somehow we made a mistake and you enter uh, without, and, and you show that you don't have those virtues or you are unable to deliver value, um, we quickly fire. So we are very, you know, we are very, uh, we built a system where we can let you go. We compensate appropriately and we let you go. So if you show yourself as somebody who doesn't care or somebody who's not relentless, somebody who's, who doesn't have a, you know, learning spirit, uh, we quickly, and you enter the business, we quickly let you go and compensate generously um, and let you go. Uh, so for us, it's really important. Those, those sort of like system that we've developed over time, to make sure that we have the right people. And we're always teaching. Um, the first instincts, whenever we have an open role is to basically look at who we have and push them. We have a stay in our life bank that you should not stay in a job past 18 months. So within life bank, you should not stay in a role. Even if the name, the title of your position is the same, in terms of what you do every day, it should not be the same. Anything past at the 19th month, you need to be changing what you're doing it because you've learned, you are growing, you're pushing yourself to the next level. So I think for us, that's what matters. We're not the coolest people. We don't give free laptops. There's no free lunch. <laughs> and then there's none of that. Uh, but what Is we do- Is there a game room? Is there a game room? Oh, there's no game room. <laughs> there's no nap oh. room. <laughs> we are professionals. <laughs> We're here to work. So there's no game room. There's no nap room. There's no free lunch. You're just here to learn to grow and to be compensated for the value you give back to the business. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, um, quickly ask um, work-life balance, um, especially for some of us that are uh, parents and also entrepreneurs also can be um, a challenge. Um, you, you have to, um, you're giving so much to your business and it can be very en engrossing at the beginning or uh, other times you're trying to scale from one point to another. And then there's this, um, other part of your life also that, that requires you to give it as much because um, sometimes I look at my kids and they feel like a startup themselves, <laughs> you know, you have to, and they're consistently involved in, you know, at one year, they're a different entity, at two, they're completely different, at three, it's, a, it's like you're starting a new business every year. Um, so how do you, how do you weigh both together? How do you keep uh, the, the, the um, balance to do this and this without one failing the other? Mm. Um, so I don't believe in work-life balance. I don't think there's such a thing. It's never mm. going to happen. Mm. I don't believe in it. I don't try to make sure there's a balance. Um, it is what it is. You know, if you're a CEO mm. of a company, you're, you're going to have to choose and balance is not going to be it. What I do believe is harmony like work-life mm. harmony. There needs to be a complete 
You know, it's like you're juggling balls. There's some days where I'm not a live bank at all because I am, you know, I have a rule. Sundays is mummy day. Uh, so on Sundays, you know, I give bad times. I cook for my family. You know, I do all the things. Monday to Saturday, you know, morning till evening, it's live bank time, you know, not mummy time. So I, I re- depend on a group of amazing people, the housekeeper, the nanny. I have the most amazing husband in the world. Um, so I really have a very strong support system. But Sunday is mommy day, not live bank day. So live bank don't bother me on Sunday. You know, it's day that I really focus on, on, my, t- on, my, on my family. So for me, I think what matters is building that harmony, making sure that you're not dropping any balls. Uh, mm. you know, children, I don't, for me as a, as a parent, I don't think uh, children, what children desperately need is, is quantity of time. I think what they need is quality of time. So when you're with them, are you actually spending that quality time with them? Are you, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time with their, with their children, but never really actually get to know them because they're either on their phone or they're distracted with TV or doing anything. But for me, I, I like to do intense, uh, you know, making sure that the quality of the time I'm spending with my children is very high. I'm speaking to them, I'm getting to know them, uh, you know. And for me, I think it's that flexibility, knowing that my work life and my home life don't need to be balanced, but I, didn't, I need to make sure that I have flexibility in these two sort of like areas of my life, I think is really important. And it's not just because I'm a mom, I think it's, you know, it's, it's required for any professional. If you wanna mm-hmm. be great, you know, if you wanna do great things in your life, it is really required that you build a life that works for you. And, and, um, and you make sure that you're serving, you know, it's like serving two masters. You have to make sure that you're serving everybody and everybody is fine. Mm-hmm. And don't feel free to rely, feel free to rely on people, you know, get a housekeeper, get a nanny if you must, you know, you know, find great people and rely on them so that you can do all the things you need to do. Yeah. Absolutely, learned, learned a lot from that. Um, Yes, yeah, so I, we have a lot of questions in the in the Q and A box right now, um, and of course, it's it's um, it's a lot of conversations that I, I see a lot of questions coming in, and we're going to take all of them now. Uh, but just wanted to remind you, this is building from ground up. Um, it's uh, it's a, a program that seeks to bring startup founders, innovators, and entrepreneurs across Nigeria and the United Kingdom. Uh, tech ecosystem to share stories on their entrepreneurship journeys and how they have been able to scale their business. Uh, This is brought to you by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Um, It's one of their major concerns as just trying to, you know, improve the technology ecosystem in Nigeria and the United Kingdom. Uh, But it's an initiative by the UK government uh, department of digital culture media and sports to support the growth of technology ecosystem in Nigeria. So yes, this is one of the things that they try to do just to try to bring conversations around um, um, uh, the tech ecosystem. And of course, it's uh, in partnership with uh, Tech Cabal. I mean, it's all technology, really. It's all technology. Um, So yes, um, I'm going to go into the questions now. You have 19 questions, Timmy. (laughs) I'm ready. I am. This is 19 questions, 19 questions. Um, so there's still more coming in, but I, <laughs> I will try and take the... So let's, let's start with this one. Um, uh, what have you found to be the biggest operational challenge for LifeBank? Mm. Biggest. What's that one thing that you, you... When you see, you just take off your weave, you're like, nah, ah. I'm not doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with security um mm. when you operate in lagos uh security is not a significant challenge for the most part i mean there's still sig- security issues but it isn't like the biggest challenge you face but once you're outside lagos you're in, in like eight states like i mentioned earlier in nigeria you understand how incredibly unsecure nigeria actually is um and and that has a lot of cost for us i think the biggest challenge the biggest pain point that I have, particularly operating within Nigeria, is figuring out how to keep my people and our equipment, our, our delivery you know, mechanisms safe uh, from people who, who don't understand uh, what we do. Uh, so security is an incredibly 
recurring challenge. Sometimes, you know, we have a, a unit um, and every time there's a security challenge, you know, there's an alert that pops up. And I live, like you said, I really just feel my wig. <laughs> I wig, get a glass of wine, and like, okay, okay, we gotta solve this problem. Um, and and it's it's a it's a, it's a recurring, incredible mm. challenge uh, operating within Nigeria, and and it's a challenge that as a country we need to solve. Yeah. Mm. So we still have more questions. Um, so this question, I. I I, I, I'm sorry that I can't take your names. Um, so this person is asking, what is LifeBank's next product or focus area? What, 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 are, you, what are you going to next? This person wants to uh, uh, be ahead of the curve. What's next for <laughs> LifeBank? Um, wow, it's, it's a lot. You know, we have an incredible um, R&D uh, system that I am just really proud of. You know, we have at least like five, six, seven products that people don't even know about that we're constantly tinkering with and getting ready and, and testing. Uh, so for me, I think that, you know, one of the things that I'm really part of, you know, at LifeBank is our quiet RMD and how we, you know, we do clinical research. We're constantly doing, you know, different types of things, partnering, you know, we have a great partnership with the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research. Uh, so we are really just like doing a lot of, on common things when you are a very small startup. Uh, so we really mm. develop our R and D. Uh, the product that I think I'm really excited about now is a system that we're calling Stock Bank, um, and it's basically providing critical medical consumables to hospitals. So moving it is slightly away from you know the emergency you know supplies that they need to just making sure that we build that silence infrastructure that will power healthcare. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, I mean, we have so much, you know, that I'm really excited about, but I think top of mind or the next one is a product called Stock Bank. Yeah. Somebody just asked, how do you make money at LifeBank? I want to know that one too. This is, this is a new question, <laughs> by the way. I, I, but I, I had to jump to this one because I'm like, yeah, I want to know yes. this too. I mean, we make money like, you know, I, I think of ourselves as um, Amazon. You know, we are a marketplace for critical resources. We can mm -hmm. make money in different ways. We make money in distribution. We make money uh, in in some of the tech that we build. Uh, so we're sort of like, you know, the same way Amazon DHL uh, makes money is how we make money. Mm -hmm. So somebody is asking in terms of uh, pricing, how were you able to determine uh, the, um, let, me just let me read it. Uh, how did you identify the right pricing for your service? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's, it's, it's always interesting. It's a, it's sort of like a, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's a, um, it's not a science, it's, a, it's an art. <laughs> and you have to focus mm -hmm. on the value you're giving to your clients and you have to price accordingly. Uh, of course, you have to be profitable. You know, you have to make sure that your unit economics is strong and that unit economics is profitable. There's profitability with unit economics. Uh, so for me, I think that uh, it really it really depends. It depends on on the, on the product and the value that first. What's the value that you're giving to the customer, and then making sure that you're pricing it appropriately to make sure that you have your unit economics is positive and that you can grow into your business. Yeah. Mm. Um, more questions here, and uh, this person is asking. So when you <clears throat> when you're expanding into a new um, country. What's the first thing you think about? Oh. Especially when with that half, you know, because it's you said two and a half. So yeah. what, what's the first thing that made you go into this half country? Mm. So you you of course you want to make sure that the there is a problem there. So the problem that you you solve with your model exists in that market. And you have to have and, and I think the second thing is the team. So the literally the first thing we do is is there a problem? Yes. And then the second thing is, you know can you find the right person to really actually drive the, 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 the model within this market? And when those two things are present, then it's a go. Yeah. All right. So somebody from Cameroon is asking, um, would like to partner with you uh, to bring your services here. How can we approach you? First of all, let me say this. Let me say this. I always say, I always say um, there's a finder's fee. Which company... <laughs> I knew where yes. that was so going. I broke this. 
I, I, I just want you to know. <laughs> no, not, not, not talk about, not UK, Nigeria. <laughs> it's you. I, it's between us. It's between us. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. We're interested. Um, you know, if you, you know, we are very open. Please send me an email. Uh, Temi, T-E-M-I-E, at livebank.ng. Please send me an email. Uh, I'll get on a call with you, see if there's value there. Like I said, it's two things. Does the problem exist in this market? And two, you know, do we have the right team? So once those th two things are there, then we'll, we'll definitely come. Um, so somebody's asking, um, any advice for non-technical founders in a tech startup world? Mm. Um, mm. Those of us that don't know how to code, um, <laughs> that don't even know what code is, um, you know, cause in, in my world, code is like uh, street lingo. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that's all it means to me. Yeah. But, but how, 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 how do non-tech uh, technical founders, how, any advice for them? Um, so you have to bring other values to the market, to the, to the business. I am, an operations person. I know operations. It's what I do. It's what I love. It's what I, and I, you know, Live Bank is an, a, a deeply operational business, right? You, you need to know tech is really critical to what we do, but operations is as well. So it wouldn't have worked if I didn't know operations well. You know, the business would not have scaled. It would not have grown. Um, and it also would not have worked if, if I didn't have the second employee of Live Bank ever. Uh, be somebody who could build tech and was sort of like a you know tech savant. Um, so for me, I think between both of us, I was like I'm like an operations um, savant and is a tech savant. Between the two of us, we were able to build a business that that's growing and that's scaling across the, the world. So I think I think that's I think that if you are not you know if you're not a tech founder, if you're not you know if you're not a technical founder, um, you need to make sure that you know the other you know a business except you're like a hard tech business, then maybe it won't work. But if you're slightly tech enabled or uh, tech is not the core thing you're selling, then you need to just make sure that the other value that the business needs to have, um, you have some expertise in that. Um, and if it's just pure tech, then know how to sell because you always need to sell things. <laughs> uh, so mm. if you come to the table with the capacity to sell and the confidence to sell, I think you're gonna be fine. So this person is asking, um... Have you ever tried partnering with the federal government, knowing fully well the challenges as a result of bottlenecks and whatnot? If yes, what were the difficulties? And I know you can plead a fifth on this um, <laughs> <laughs> because we know the, the, the challenges with the Nigerian government, but what, what were your challenges? Have you ever tried to? And if you have, because I know you have, um, what were the challenges? Uh, you know, we've, we've tried. I really believe, you know, I, you know, the problem that I set out to solve with LifeBank was actually a problem that I saw in, in a public sector hospital and not, it wasn't a private sector thing in terms of what was in my head. It ended up being a value. The biggest value was also to the private sector. They loved it and they, they jumped on board immediately. Um, and we've tried, you know, of course the federal government, we have a great, great relationship with them, um, mainly because they are a regulator and you need to, healthcare is incredibly regulated. Uh, so we need to maintain a, a, a working <laughs> relationship with the federal government, yeah. so give props for that. And to be quite honest, you know, I know a lot of us don't give them props, but I give them props to regulating us well. Um, first, they make sure that we're doing what we need to do well. And, and they don't get in the way in terms of as long as we, they see that our system is state of the art, and it is. Uh, so I really give them props for that. But in terms of um, having a partnership or a relationship that is um, us bringing our innovation into the hospitals that the federal government has, that has not happened. Um, I'm, not, you know, I'm not ruling it out, uh, but I think the reality is it's also a big world, you know, it's a big problem. You know, it doesn't mean that Live Bank is gonna suffer if we don't get, you know, government, you know, uh, uh, um, agency into, into our system. You know, we can go outside the country, you know, we can expand to different, you know, continents, uh, et cetera. So for me, I think I focus on that, you know, if, if, if it's not gonna work, then move on to the next thing. Yeah, but, you know, again, very great relationship in terms of regulation. 
<laughs> yeah, better be. Um, so let me ask uh, this question. Uh, it's, it's about, um, this person is asking here that, um, um, did you have prospective customers before launching or you got your customers after launching? Um, so launching is a, a, a strange term uh, because mm. we really never launched anything. We just started. We, you know, we, we had put the product and we started going to the hospital. We told the hospital and then they started using it and we didn't bother launching actually. We never did like a launch uh, in, terms mm. of, in terms of the product. But really when we were building it, it was an idea. Of course, it didn't have a customer at the time. Uh, it was just an idea that I had. Um, I still had a full-time job at the time. Uh, so I basically was using my salary to, to build the product. And once the product was there, um, I was able to quit my job. Oof. Um, and then we, you know, we started, you know, going out to the hospitals and saying, you know, do you want to try this? Do you want to try this? Uh, for a marketplace, which is what Life Bank is, uh, it's really important. And advice that I can give is it's really important that you get the, the demand side first, uh, sorry, the supply side first before demand. Because if supply come, if demand comes and supply is not there, uh, you will fail. Uh, so we mm. really, in the beginning, we focus on the, 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 the supply side. So we focus on the blood banks, on the oxygen manufacturers, et cetera. Um, and then once we had a couple of people who were good, then we went to the, to the, sub, to the demand and started speaking to hospitals. So for us, we, we, of course, it was an idea. We built it without having a customer, but as soon as we had a customer, we didn't bother launching, we focus on getting those customers. And that's what we've been doing since. So I um, still have a few questions coming in. Somebody asking if you have a co-founder. I'm not sure if the person wants to be your co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have a co-founder. Um, you know, I have very early employees who, who of course uh, own uh, the business, own some of the business, uh, but no co-founders. Mm, mm, mm. Um, still more questions. Um, let me see. Where do you get your supplies from? Mm. Like I said, we're like, you know, Amazon, you know, Conga Market, yeah. you know, uh, like, you know, you know, we work with suppliers who want to, we're sort of like an aggregator and a distributor. Mm. Yeah. So mm. we work with many, many, we have about 300 suppliers. So mm. I, don't, I don't know where to start. Uh, so, um, so this person says, please mention at least two founders that you would have recommended for a health tech, uh, tech startup. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand what that question is saying. Please mention it, please. Okay, yeah, I, I don't get it. Um, <laughs> this one is, oh, funders. Oh, funders. Um, Please mention at least two funders that you would recommend for a health tech startup uh, with six months traction uh, to apply to. So the person is looking for money. <laughs> um, there are yeah, many, many... The money. Tell us the money. <laughs> money is everywhere, guys. Um, <laughs> if you have traction, so not so what traction you know are you making money if you're making money money is gonna find you so i don't even need to recommend anyone like if you mm -hmm. start up and you're already making money um just you know talk to a couple of investors literally just like you know, go search you know vcs in nigeria and and go speak with them i think that you'll be actually if you're making money you'll be surprised at how easy it is to pull off yeah mm -hmm. that would be my mm -hmm. I, I do know this uh, because money is weird. I, I have a friend who was trying to raise money at some point and he didn't get, um, he wasn't able to get the money. After the business really got off and got traction, all the people he went to to try and raise money were like, hey, you said you needed money that time. <laughs> come, come, come back. <laughs> it is what it is. I don't, like, I don't need it anymore. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I get it. Um, that's, that's we're what? going to be launching a poll um, for, because uh, we uh, this is a recurring um, event, a building from ground up. So we're just going to launch a poll shortly. Uh, so if you do see the poll come up, Please uh, vote at, uh, appropriately as you think, and uh, we would. Um, uh, so it's a basic question, really. It's a basic question, and um, let me see if I can find the question here. Um, 
Sorry. Oh, yes, I have a question. So it's just two polls. Um, so it, this is telling you are not allowed to participate in this poll. You're not allowed. So the poll question is, um, what year was Lifeback founded? Hmm. 2014, 2015, or 2016? Tell me you are not allowed. You are disqualified from this poll. I can't even do it. They've removed my, <laughs> my <laughs> I can't, I can't participate. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for whoever did that. <laughs> yes, she cannot. And uh, let me let me let me vote. I think I know. And second, um, second question is which of these African countries has Life Bank expanded to? I already gave you expo for that. If you do not know, you do not know. Sorry, I've tried my best. <laughs> what can I do? And um, three, how many African countries is Life Bank present in? So um, I know we said half, uh, but we can remove the half or you can round it up. Depending on you, round it up or round it down. Uh, nearest whole number. You decide which of them you're going to go with. Um, so yes, this, this, this uh, polls. Um, um, it's, it's, it's been a fun conversation. If you have any more questions, please let me, let's take them. We, we're taking your questions now. Um, let me see. We have more questions. We have more questions. I have quite a few. Um, yeah, so I, I love the, the general context to which I just want to say this, the way you put it um, as concerns being the Amazon of um, medical supplies, which of course puts it in better perspective. Um, I, I've, I've always just known it as a, oh, if I'm looking for blood, I should just uh, call Timmy. Um, in fact, I, I have your number saved as Timmy blood now, you know, just in case, <laughs> awesome. you know? You know, because at that point you might be in a, in, in a desperate, like, so yeah, you want to get it, but of course it's, it's easier to get to Life Bank than just to, you know, get to you. Either ways, I'm sure we'll get it. So let me ask this question because this question has already been asked already by me, but I think um, let me just put them also out there. This person says, what are the challenges faced while trying to partner hospitals in Nigeria? You know, um, our healthcare funding is really problematic. You know, um, we don't have public pools. You know, people have to pay for healthcare out of their pocket. So if you need to have surgery, for, for, for example, today, and let's say you need to have, let's say you're delivering a baby and you had expected, you know, a vagina birth, and, but now it needs to be a cesarean section. Um, you know, right now in Nigeria, you will, um, you will have to find the money. It's about 200,000 Naira, um, and you need to pay for that money out of pocket. And uh, we know about 70 to 80% of our population lives on less than $2 a day. So, you know, people don't have money. They don't have money and healthcare is expensive and there's no systemic way. We've never built a public pool, a public option to pay for healthcare. Uh, so I think that a lot of the challenges we face is in the poverty of our population, uh, is in the fact that we've not built a, a, a working um, health insurance, public pooling uh, system to pay for healthcare. Uh, so I think that that's always the biggest challenge. And, you know, blood and oxygen is not something that people need. Sorry, it's not something that people want. It's they need. Uh, so yeah. if you're bleeding, you need blood. <laughs> you may or may not want blood, but you need it to survive. Need it, yeah. <laughs> same thing for oxygen, same thing for gloves. And so what we're doing is really, really a need, you know, not a want. Um, and if you don't have the money, you're gonna die. Uh, so when you're a business, how do you how do you build a, a, a structure uh, to ensure that, that that doesn't happen? Do you need to get into payments? You know what are what are the things that you need to do to make sure that you actually solve that entrenched problem? So for us, a life bank is the biggest issue. The fact that Nigeria and actually Africa hasn't bothered uh, to build a health financing infrastructure that works for our people. I, I tell you, it's, um, I, I, I also um, had a thought at some point when I was trying to get a HMO uh, for my family, and I realized that I had to be calling one HMO to the other, telling them, I want this hospital. No, I don't, I will not agree. I, they'll say, okay, you have to go on a special plan for you mm. to get that hospital. 
uh, we'll, you pay extra. I'm like, well, why am I paying extra? Shouldn't I just get it? It's, 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 well, it is what it is. Um, yeah, it is what it is. Somebody's asking, um, how did you handle rejection whenever it happened? Because, of course, um, the sweet story now is that, you know, Life Bank is, is, a, is a major name in Nigeria. But people said no at some point. They're still saying no. <laughs> <laughs> I said their intention today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so how do you handle it? How do you, I mean, it's easier now, I'm sure. But how did you handle it at the beginning? Especially when that no almost felt like um, things would not get off the ground. Mm, 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 mm. Um, I remember there was a day where I only had enough money to pay the next salary. And there was this, it was actually a public event. And I don't think I handled it well. I put, I had practiced, it, there was a pitch, I think it was like, it was such a small money. I mean, thinking about it now, but at the time it meant the world. Um, and, and it was a public pitch. I gave it my all. Oh, you know, I was, and I remember they said no. And I almost started crying on the stage. Literally, like I almost started crying on the stage. I just gave myself enough time to get in the car and like bold like a baby. Um, so I think that, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're gonna, and I have, like, I just uh, told that one story where it, it's not the worst, you know, I get no <laughs> every single day. And in the beginning, it can seem like it is over and it can seem like people don't understand. I used to say to people like, do people know that if Live Bank is not, you know, viable, it means that a lot of people will die. How are people not understanding this? Like it always like just really shake, like it's, you know, it's hard, you know, it's difficult to, for people not to feel what you feel about your business because you're of course incredibly passionate about it. Uh, so, you know, how do you handle it? You know, for me, I think I give myself a day or a couple of hours, if that's what I have. Uh, in the beginning, you know, I would just like make sure that I feel it. And then next day I get up and go. Um, and for me, I think that's, that's, that resilience is incredibly important. I always say like one of the biggest job for a CEO is managing your own psychology. And mm. it's really, really important because you're going to get no's. Investors will say no's. Uh, customers will say no. Your employees will say no. You know, one mm. of the, you know, the, 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 the one that actually really hurts most is when a senior, somebody you are building will say, I'm leaving. And like, you literally like cry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people will say no to you. So managing your own psychology is really really important um you need to figure out what you need to feel good and then because you gotta get back to it you gotta like mm -hmm. take a couple of hours take a day to think to feel the thing you feel and then next day you need to get back up and start executing again um mm -hmm. that was in the beginning now i don't even get a day i don't even get 20 minutes <laughs> to feel bad so i literally was like okay you have 10 minutes to know the feelings and then get back to it. Um, so I think that, you know, you're going to get news. You just have to manage your own psychology and make sure that you're ready to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, what I tell my people is, uh, as, as, is as an entrepreneur, um, at those points, if you have to cry, cry. Now, nah, business, you do, you don't keep us in, you know? <laughs> There's no way that you can cry. You don't do <laughs> I, I, I get in, I, I get in my feelings. I give myself a, a couple of hours to cry it out and then I'm back to it. So I, I definitely tell people all the time, feel free, feel free. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're going to be sharing a post event survey in the chat room soon. So um, I encourage you to fill it. Um, it will help us, um, you know, better align uh, the uh, building from ground up uh, sessions uh, better for you just to help you. Uh, help us uh, understand what exactly you're looking for in these sessions and, you know, better uh, curate it for you. Um, somebody's asking another question, Timmy. Um, how did you address logistics challenges uh, from getting the blood from the blood bank uh, to where it is needed since blood is needed in emergency? So, yeah, I've thought about that too. Hospital A is in, um, I don't know, um, Bagada. And your um, the black the bank is in VI. Mm -hmm. Your office or somewhere is in Ikui. Bidi bang, bidi boom, push. We need blood in Bagada right now. Mm -hmm. How do you manage those challenges? How how do you 
how do you roll out? What, what's the, what's the, uh, it's, um, okay, so for people who don't have kids, you might not understand what I'm about to say, but Paw Patrol, <laughs> oh my God, I, I just, I just feel, yes, sorry. I, I can't believe I just did that. I get it. Um, <laughs> anyways, Paw Patrol, um, kill me, sue me. Uh, whenever there's a problem, they have this thing that they do, they roll down, there's this like high tower, then they come down, everybody comes out and they roll out in their trucks and things like that, and then they go out and solve the problem. Um, what What's the Paw Patrol um, mm. situation for life, Max? I love that. Um, as a friend, <laughs> yeah, I, we're past the Paw Patrol stage, now we're in superheroes, so everything is superhero related. <laughs> so I, I definitely understand. Um, in terms of, you know, we're a distribution business. So that's literally what we do every day. Um, when a, a hospital would literally call and say, I have 40 minutes, get here. And we have to get there. Um, uh, so we, we do a hub and spoke system. So we're really wildly diffused across the city. Um, and um, at any given moment, we can get to the hospital within 45 minutes. Uh, so most of our orders are delivered in 45 minutes, under 45 mm. minutes. Mm. Um, so it's really perfected. We bring, you know, platforms, proprietary technology. We partnered with Google. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of work to make sure that we can hit that time and beat that time. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's who we are, Live Bank. That's what we do. Uh, yeah. Awesome, awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, it's there are more questions coming in. I'm not sure we can take more of those questions now because um, if, if you do not know while you're watching this, we have spent almost an hour and a half. Um, just <laughs> yes, it, I know it just it just went by like that. But yes, we have spent almost a, an hour and a half. And um, yes, there will be a, a, a survey in the chat room coming up, so that you could just. Uh, um, fill those, fill it, and, and let us know. We just want to be able to better curate this content for you. Building the ground up um, is a program that seeks to build startup founders, innovators, and entrepreneurs across the Nigeria and United Kingdom tech ecosystem to share their stories on their entrepreneurship journeys and how they've been able to scale their business. Uh, and uh, today we've been talking with uh, uh, Temi. Uh, Giwa Tubosu. She's basically the founder of um, Life Bank. Life Bank. bank. If you just think about it in any bank at all, but imagine the bank, you know, keeping and issuing out life. Yes, mm -hmm. that is Life Bank. Um, well, also, uh, it's brought to you by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Uh, the Building Ground Up is brought to you by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Um, it's, uh, it's an initiative of the UK government, uh, Department of Digital Culture and Media and Sports um, to support growth and technology ecosystem in Nigeria. Uh, they work to stimulate local digital economies, support inclusive and sustainable economic growth and jobs, build high-end digital skills and forge innovative partnerships between Nigeria tech uh, sector and international business. So if you... Um, we want to say thank you. Please do say thank you to them for bringing Timmy to come and speak to us today and share from the heart. Um, there was a part in the entire thing um, where it got a bit emotional. I was like, Timmy's not going to make me cry today. I will <laughs> not cry in front of people. It's not going to happen. Um, yes. I want to thank Timmy for joining us today. And this is also brought to you in partnership with Tech About. Um, thank you for the... Um, if, you, if you've noticed at any point I'm looking down I'm having conversations, you know, all kinds of things with my eyes and things. So thanks to the team for um, um, massive support. So I think, um, yes, we're right at that point. Um, so we're gonna have, yes, the, is that the poll coming up? I'm not sure what that is. It's coming up right now. I, I think it is. I think they've dropped the link to the poll. Okay, yes. So tell me, I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, it's, 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 it's 2020, vision is, um, hindsight vision is 2020. Um, a lot of people are looking at companies like yours, Paystack, mm. and thinking, ah, when we're starting, we're just looking at them like noisemakers, you know, now it's, it's, it's now big and everybody wants to, you know, start up now, um, you know. 
what, what what's that what's that one thing that you you want them to have in mind especially everybody that now thinks uh going into being an entrepreneur or having a tech startup is now this sexy um thing to do everybody just wants to uh be a founder a co-founder a a, a a ceo what was that thing you want them to have at the back of the mind it's gonna be hard. Oh my god, it's gonna be really. <laughs> Why did you start that way? <laughs> <laughs> we need to tell the truth. Uh, uh, it's gonna be really incredible, uh, incredibly hard. Uh, starting anything is hard in any way in the world, no matter how much institutions and how much support you have. Starting anything is emotional. It's emotionally hard. It's physically taxing. Your body's gonna go through it. You know, there's that saying, like when presidents become actually good presidents, specifically presidents of the United States, they co- go in with like nice looking face, you know, yeah. hair, and they come in looking like they've been through a war. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna happen to you <laughs> because it's good, it's the reality. But I think building something from the ground up. You know, building something, making something happen from nothing is incredibly rewarding. Uh, So although it's going to be difficult, I think the rewards are really high. Um, For me, what is the advice that I have for you in terms of, you know, bridging the gap between the high reward and and the really deeply, terribly hard part of the work? I think it's figuring out why you're doing it. If you know your why and you continue operating and executing on that why, every single day, I think it gets easier. So it, it is going to be hard, particularly when you're doing it in Nigeria or Africa. Oh my God, forget it. <laughs> it's going to be really, really difficult. Um, but it's also very rewarding. And the way to sort of like make sure that the reward and the, and the difficulty are merged uh, or you can, you can continue operating is to know the why and execute on that why every day. All right, so I want to say uh, thank you, uh, Timmy, for being with us on uh, this uh, episode of Building the Ground Up. Um, it has been a great session. I um, want to thank you for sharing your um, your story with us on Building Ground Up. Thank you very, very much. Um, so for everyone that is um, part of this, um, I want you to do two things for me, two things. Uh, first of all, um, just sh- say thank you to Timmy on, on Twitter, if you can, you know, for sharing, sharing this uh, conversation with us. It was, it was a great conversation. Also, you want to, um, uh, I mean, want to thank uh, the organizers, the UK Nigeria Tech Hub, uh, for doing this. It's um, really, I appreciate them for, for bringing this uh, conversation to the fore and making sure that um, um, we have uh, more conversations about it. So um, it, it's really about building Nigeria's digital economy. Um, and um, the conversation really is about making sure that uh, more and more um, um, tech founders and innovators, entrepreneurs across Nigeria and the United Kingdom uh, tech ecosystem share their stories uh, of their entrepreneurial journeys and how they've been able to scale their business. Um, The program also seeks to serve as a platform to inspire upcoming entrepreneurs, gain insights to enable them drive innovation and impact a global space. So if you know startups, uh, uh, startup founders and people who are about to go into the space, um, you want to tell them to uh, join the next session. The next session is going to be uh, December 16th, um, if I am right. Yes, December 16th. Um, You want to make sure that you're part of that. Um, and, uh, you know, just um, get into that. I um, want to also thank again, I, I can't do this enough, thanking the UK Nigeria Tech Hub, uh, the initiative of the UK government's Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sports uh, to support growth and technology ecosystem in Nigeria. I want to thank them for bringing this together. Also, thank you to Tech Kaba uh, for doing all the technical support here and making sure that everything is A-OK in um bringing this to you. So to everybody that joined, thank you very much for joining. Timmy, thank you very much for joining. And um, I, I, I pretty much shouldn't be doing this. I've never done this in my life, but I want to thank myself for also doing this. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much, every single person. Uh, we'll be doing this again to December 16th, so you don't want to miss it. I, I implore you to tell everybody that you know to be a part of this. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.
Yes, you can follow on the, um, in the, the social media platforms. You can see them on the screen right now. Um, social media platforms. Uh, on Twitter is UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Uh, please uh, follow them and send a message. On Instagram is UKNG Tech Hub. Um, on Twitter is UKNG Tech Hub. And on Instagram is UK uh, Nigeria Tech Hub. So basically follow them on all platforms and let's continue the conversation. Have a great one. Tell me. Bye. See you.